right, hello everybody. I want to do it this time, but with a fun meeting. Howdy! Howdy! There it is, all right. But I love that, that was great. Um, okay, so uh, many of you here know Texas A&M or are from Texas A&M, but Texas A&M has been an amazing educational partner for side effects for many, many, many years. Uh, I think we have a pretty great relationship. <laughs> <laughs> pretty awesome. We've got employees back here from Texas A&M. We've had many interns from Texas A&M. Uh, and the student work is always fascinating and amazing. So we want to highlight some of that work here today and some of the programs that are going on uh, at Texas A&M and College Station. So I am going to hand it over to Matt to take over from here. And I will have the mic available for um, the team to introduce themselves. So Matt. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Mayette Andreasen, and I am the um, associate. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm the associate program director for the BS in visualization, and I'm also an instructional assistant professor, so I teach classes as well. And um, our students uh, really have uh, taken to using Houdini wonderfully. These are some examples of some of their work. Uh, here's a picture of me. So our students are Julia Bosbert, Skylar Thomas, Alyssa Curran, uh, Izzy Rolo, Emma Krillowitz, Ryan Appleby, Macy McCuller, and Sarah Razuk. Um, a little bit of background about visualization, and then I'll have the students introduce themselves, give you a little of their background, and let them take over. Um, so visualization is now part of the School of Performance Visualization and Fine Arts. Yay! Woo -hoo! Woo -hoo! <laughs> and um, uh, as uh, was introduced by John, our, our students, students use Houdini both in game development and in animation production classes to wonderful, wonderful effect. This year, um, a, a large part of the um, uh, work that is going to be introduced uh, is going to have grooming introduced. So for summer industry course, Last summer, summer 20, or this past summer, 2022, uh, our, our school teamed up with DreamWorks Animation. And part of the scope that DreamWorks set for the students was they had to bring a toy to life and they had to integrate a groom in that. Okay, so I am going to let the students take over now. Who's going first? Who wants first? to get started? Yeah, you guys would go ahead and use so the podium if you want one at a time. But yeah, for introductions, yeah. All right, uh, howdy. My name is Ryan Appleby. Uh, I'm a senior. <laughs> That's it. Uh, cool. Uh, howdy. My name is Emma Krillowitz, and I'm also a senior. Why did you use Houdini? Houdini's <laughs> 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 fun. <laughs> they will. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Skyler. I'm a master's student, and I got to first use Houdini this past summer with our short. Hi, I'm Macy McCuller. I use Houdini specifically for games. Hi, I'm Melissa Kern. I'm a master's student and I used Houdini this summer to create a character room for our animation short. Hi, I'm Julia Boisvert. Uh, I'm a senior and it was also my first time using Houdini this summer. Hi, I'm Sarah Razuk. I'm a master's student and I used Houdini this summer for micro dressing. Hi, I'm Izzy Rolo and I used Houdini uh, this past summer for VFX and I've used it on various projects over the last few years for VFX and uh, modeling. So we're gonna get started with Macy McCuller and she is going to tell us about some of her amazing projects using Houdini. All right, um, so I guess we've talked about this a little bit throughout today. Um, it's been mentioned, but I have, um, sorry, a little nervous, um, but um, I created a um, little city generator using wave function collapse. So wave function collapse allows you to take in like an input bitmap and generate a bunch of different configurations from it um, and then use that input to spawn a fully fledged uh, level generator in terms of like Simon's dungeon or um, in my instance, a little city. Um, for example, you know, the what's going on behind the hood is you have um, a series of like black and white or different um, points 
which then allow you to show um, or signal to the program of where you want like the blocked off areas versus the active like walkways and stuff like that. Um, and then I have a little um, video just kind of demonstrating um, the entire workflow process of how you can get from a uh, input to a fully fledged like playable proxy level. So here I'm just importing that input bitmap that I created um, and showing off how you can quickly uh, get different seeds for the generator or put in even a different input and until you kind of like figure out which one works for your level layout. And then um, I'm adding kind of like a walled off area on the end, manually setting the edge points so that way the player can't explore outside of the level bounds. And then I'm actually stacking different um, configurations so you can uh, have a more city-like structure instead of the overall, um, instead of it being flat. Because usually you would use an input uh, bitmap for these inputs. So it is, um, but yeah, and then I have a, uh, I have it working in engine, so you can go in and change the size, the scale, walk around inside, and everything there. So, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then um, I also have another project that I worked on. Um, so I actually made this for the Houdini Game Jam with. Um, two of my fellow students that are actually here, V and Brad. Um, and Brad did the programming and V did those nice textures, because I'm not a texture artist, but um, I created a level generator that um, allows you to spawn like a grid of hex tiles and then actually have the user control where they place, you know, the different biomes that we had interact within our um, Houdini game, our, our game for the game jam. So here I have a little bit better of a uh, demonstration of what it looked like working in engine. So um, I'm adding water, rocks, um, different sand sims, and, or not sand sims, um, but sand areas and um, elevation sh showing um, we had tree resources that we needed to add and it's all driven off of attribute paint. So um, the user is just has a uh, paintbrush and allow it, they can designate which areas they want. And then I also divided up the mesh to better import into Unreal. Um, the other thing that was pretty cool about this specific instance is we tried to use as much like Houdini and Unreal like crossover. So all of our blueprints and all of the interactables were spawned in our game using Houdini, um, specifically with the Houdini engine um, crossover there. But yeah, so um, I, I like level generation and this was some of my work. Um, so Maya, Maya kind of already introduced SIC. Um, so all the next like few projects that we're going to show are examples of how we used Houdini this past summer in our projects. Uh, so Skylar and I both worked on Forsaken with a team of four others. Um, Daniel's actually here. He was on our team as well. Um, I can go ahead and play it. I don't know if there's audio. So there you have it. It is not exiting for some reason. There we go. All right. Um, so one of the most challenging parts of this SIC was, like Mayette mentioned, we had introduced grooming as part of the requirements. And as soon as we decided that our character is going to be a doll, um, I realized, OK, so we're going to have to do like an actual full hair groom. 
Um, and so originally the plan was to use XGen for that, um, but our pipeline tech who knew a lot about XGen and how to get it to render on our pipeline was leaving in a week uh, to go work at Pixar. And so like we quickly were like, oh my gosh, we're gonna have to figure all this stuff out. We're gonna have to get it to render on our pipeline somehow by the end. Um, and so we started kind of exploring other avenues. Um, Ryan and I spent some time like working with Curves and Houdini and bringing those into Maya and rendering them with RenderMan. And we found that to be like a very easy process for us. Uh, and so we quickly pivoted to that instead. Um, so I was a look development artist uh, for my team and I worked on the doll hair groom. And so this kind of was the start of the process, as you can see. Uh, so I worked with a hybrid process between like XGen and Houdini. And so uh, I, I started in Maya modeling out the tubes um, and tube grooming essentially uh, is a process where you model tubes and uh, you kind of fashion them into like the shape of the hair that you're going for. And from those tubes, you can generate guides, which then generate the hair. And so uh, I spent some time in Maya first, getting that process down, getting kind of the shape that we wanted for the hair. Uh, and then the next step was to bring those guides that were generated within XGen uh, into Houdini. Um, so basically the whole process was, I would get those guides, I would bring them in as curves to Houdini, I get those curves uh, to read as guides and then I would move on to the styling. So those guides would generate the hair um, and, and then I would just be able to actually like play around with the hair with the texture of it. Uh, this was actually kind of an extensive process just because there wasn't a whole lot of you know, documentation just for like actually figuring out how to get um, curves from Maya into Houdini to get them to work with this process. Um, I also ended up figuring out that if you separated the groom into like a lot of separate parts, so I'd bring in the curves um, into like separate groups uh, and then like have them as different guide groom nodes, then I was able to better control the actual shape of it. Uh, so that, that very um, right side, that right picture, uh, the styling process was actually so much fun to do in Houdini because um, you basically just got to add a lot of procedural noise onto it, which was super fast and super iterative. Um, but you also within like the actual guide groom nodes. So with the guides, you could go in and kind of paint in shapes that you wanted. And so it was a really nice balance of like artistic, um, just like you, you were able to make it artistically how you wanted to, but you could also add on a bunch of procedural noise and kind of break things up really easily and really fast. Uh, and so this right here was just kind of that final product. Um, so I, this process was really a great process because I think it will allow like our pipeline in the future to just use Houdini more often, um, especially because our pipeline can handle like curves from Houdini. So, I mean, beyond hair, like you can, you can use that for a bunch of different tools. We'll see that later on in the presentation. Um, but it was just a lot of fun to play around with and a really great experience overall. Good. Go ahead and pass off to Skyler. Right. Hello, my name is Skyler. I was the effects and animation lead for our project. This is just a quick breakdown of some of the effects um, we did, and then I'll go into further detail.
just gonna break down the webs a little bit. So our short took place in an abandoned antique store. So we needed to find a way to populate the scene with lots of cobwebs. And so I did not want to have to hand model these cobwebs. Uh, so I jumped into Houdini, did a lot of research and a lot of learning and started to iterate uh, this is going to be some look development of I had to start out with a sphere input. It's basically I scatter a lot of points around and then connect between the points. Um, and then after I got the sphere to work, I had to put two planes in there to check to make sure webs could connect between different geometry. Um, then I moved on to some more inorganic, ge inorganic geometry. Um, then we started importing some of our assets into the scene to see if the web tool would also work on those. Um, as I started getting more iterations, I began adding more detail to the webs, like adding dust, adding little hair to give that little fuzzy look. Um, and, then, and then the tool was able to be expanded to where we can import any of our assets we created into Houdini and the web tool would generate. And we could kind of art direct it, um, make them more dense, like in that bottom picture, uh, make them more scattered around and then we, Emma and Ryan, found a way to get the Houdini curves to work with RenderMan so we could start adding some shading to them. And Houdini was great because it allowed me to iterate fast and quick and pop out lots of webs, lots of different designs. Um, so over the summer, we were really trying to get that shot one, the hero webs, what we called them, to look great. So I did a lot of iterations to try to get those nights lost and found and the holes in there so we could see the background of the scene. Um, and, and then we got our final look um, with the shading and lighting and depth of field to work with the webs. But yeah, Houdini, we could, I could not have populated the scene without building that tool. So it was really great to learn. Hi, I'm Alyssa. Um, I am a surfacing and look development artist. And my main responsibility on this short that I worked on with a team of five other artists was to create the character's short fur groom. And I also did some background prop uh, modeling and surfacing. And I can go ahead and play this short. <laughs> So the process to create this groom, since I actually had two grooms with this character, was first starting with references of stuffed animals and then actual wolves and trying to figure out how I wanted the fur to flow on the character. Um, a main part of this groom was getting the directionality to work so it feels believable like a real stuffed animal. And after examining those references, I moved on to doing some quick tests in Houdini and then moving on to the actual creation process where I used what I learned to create the rest of the groom. So our initial concepts um, were very helpful in trying to determine the directionality of the fur. Like on this example, I wanted to make sure the flow was um, believable to the characters. So I was looking at a lot of the references and then I moved on to the first test of the fur in Houdini, and I brought it into RenderMan to render it. And I noticed some limitations of the directionality didn't really feel very believable. And the shading was also another big concern as with the full body render, the colors just weren't looking accurate and the, um, the specular roughness just wasn't looking believable to stuffed animal fur. So that was something that we had to 
overcome later on in the process using a different shader. For the actual creation of the fur, I wanted to identify the different parts of the fur that had like different lengths. So like the muzzle area would be shorter fur, the head would be like longer fur. So in order to get this difference of fur, I had to mask out the different reason, regions in Substance Painter. And then I brought that into Houdini. And from that mask, I was able to generate the fur on the character, the different regions of the character. After doing that, I decided to use some more procedural methods of creating the fur because the first test, I just artistically combed the fur and that wasn't really very believable. So I added some procedural noise. And then after I was happy with that, I moved into adding modifiers like clumping and lift and bend to try to get the fur to appear more believable. The bottom uh, left image was with no clumping and the hair just felt really stiff. So that was um, something I had to add more clumping and noise to make that more believable and also some flyaways to make the fur look softer. For the tufts, I also used the tube grooming process that Emma used where I created the shapes in Maya and then I exported the curves and brought them into Houdini. And then from there, I was able to shape the guides and then starting to add clumping and noise and flyaways to make the graphic shapes that we were looking to hit that were in the concept art for the tufts. And then after that was all complete, we brought it into um, RenderMan and we used the llama surface shader and that was a big game changer for um, this groom and all the other grooms from summer industry course because it gave more of a believable look to the fur and match more what you would expect hair to hair and fur to look like um, in real life. And I can go on to the turntable. And this is the final product. And that's all. Thank you. And I will pass it on to Ryan. Howdy y'all, uh, my name's Ryan again. Um, so this summer we worked on the short called Lily, so I'll go ahead and play that for you. So that was the summer industry course short that me and Sarah both worked on, both of us utilizing Houdini. Um, my portion of this was, wow, it does that every time. My portion of this was working on the character's look development as well, uh, taking a little bit of a different approach. Uh, we were shooting for a yarn character. So right off the bat, there was a lot of opportunities to dive into Houdini and really build out some robust systems that would be scalable for the different elements. Um, off the bat, we were going for a cloth dress, the yarn weave, and the hair, those being the main elements, um, and hopefully tying those all back into a singular system that could be adjusted to get those three effects. So what we ended up making was a textile tool suite. Um, in short, it was just a combination of a few different HDAs that would get these desired results um, some of the main HDAs that were incorporated into this system was a UV projection mapping, a yarn tool, a thread tool, and then a coloring system for the generated geometries. And over here, we have a quick snapshot of just kind of how we were stacking those together. The goal of this system was to make it modular so that each one of these HDAs could stand alone and be used as a robust um, individual tool but when stacked together, they'd start to build out that effect that we were looking for in our character. So walking through those individual um, HDAs that we made, the first one being that 3D mapping for, or UV mapping for the 3D geometry. Um, the idea behind this, many other people have already started to dive into this system, um, but what it's doing is it's taking those UV tiles that are already used for 
um, normal texture mapping and using it to project flat surfaces. So what this gave us the opportunity to do is utilize, as in this lower image, utilize flat textile sheets that, you know, just using simple Houdini geometry systems, you can create um, what a fabric would do in the physical world, except that's being on a flat plane. Then using this system that we had created, we were able to map that to the character um, and start to get that really warped look. So that was one of the first HDAs that we really built out in order to bring this effect to life. The other one that we were creating was getting the actual yarn nature. Um, so that really modeling after the physical means. Um, Houdini definitely giving us the platform to simulate reality when creating these different effects. Um, and like expressed earlier with the HDAs, layering the smaller details as it kind of builds on itself in order to simulate reality. Um, we were starting with the big broad shapes and as it broke down, adding finer and finer detail, it wasn't actually adding too much complexity in the nodes, but because of that detail breakdown, it started to really develop and bring that realism um, that we were searching for with the photorealistic quality. So those two systems together um, using this UV projection and then this yarn tool allowed us to really build out the character. Um, and those different parameters, since we were creating HGAs that had a lot of flexibility to them, they were able to create all these different effects just using those really simple nodes. Um, getting stuff like this yarn hair, the weave tool, the bangs, and then that lace for the dress all, all of these different images were produced using that one suite of tools that we developed. So I'll now pass it over to Sarah um, and she can talk about her FX stuff. Or, Izzy. Or Izzy. <laughs> Hi, I'm Izzy. I was the VFX lead on this project. Um, I worked on the candle flames. Uh, funny story, I was actually in SIC in 2020 and we had three lit candles and I worked on the wax shader for that. And at the beginning of this summer, I said, please, can we not do candles? Um, and we ended up having a total of 50 lit candles between two shots in our four shot uh, project. So um, here's just the effects breakdown for the candles. Um, this was what was rendered from Houdini or was brought in from Houdini. Um, and this was the candles within uh, shot one. And this is shot four. So the main challenge for, let's see, let's go here. The main challenge that I had for creating this um, candle effect was that we had to, uh, in shot one, have all of these instance candle flames come on at different times. Um, in shot four, we had to have all of the candle flames turn off at different times. And we wanted to have artistic control over that. Um, and so what we ended up doing, because um, we would have been able to use something like the X coordinate, Y coordinate to turn off these candles by their location in the scene. But we, in our project, they were kind of circling our character. Um, so I had to come up with a different solution for how I instanced them and um, directed like what time they would come on. So what I ended up doing was taking the, uh, candle geometry into Houdini. Uh, I took all of the wick uh, meshes and I made them into points and then combined all of the points um, pretty much manually for each side. I like, directed the um, direction that I wanted the curve to go on uh, uh, both the left and the right side of shot one. And I um, assigned a color to this curve that was um, black to white. 
uh, or that faded from black to white. And I made that color and assigned it to a float and then used that float to determine what frame um, each of these candles would turn on. So it was a little bit of a complex process. Um, and same for shot four. From the camera's point of view, it looks like it's just going like a white from right to left. But really in 3D space, these candles were not turning off in a singular direction. So I had to do the same thing on this one where I created a curve um, and assigned a float value, which would determine when these candles would turn off. So that was the main challenge I had with the candles. And I can pass it off to Sarah to talk about her stuff now. Hi, I'm Sarah. I was the environment looked of artist for Lily. Um, I'll play what I did. So my focus was on micro dressing this summer. I learned a lot about micro dressing and how animation studios utilize micro dressing in their surfacing. Um, this was my first time ever using Houdini. So it was a great introduction. Um, I used like the scatter node and the attribute randomized node to get a more natural look when scattering things like pebbles and stacking leaves against the side of the sidewalk. Um, and I thought we achieved a more natural look with our environment. But yeah. And there's the final look. But I can pass it off to Julia. Hi, I'm Julia. Um, I was a look development and groom lead for our short serendipity. So I'm gonna go ahead, oh, oh goodness. Go ahead and play this. So you guys can see we had the groom done in Houdini and then we also had our poof and our potion drip in Houdini and the candles. Um, but yeah, I'll be talking about the groom today. So I kind of, <laughs> here, uh, Mayette got this like little doll <laughs> thing. Um, <laughs> I broke it down into the preparation stage and then the development stage. And honestly, most of my time was spent in the preparation stage. Um, it was really daunting to me, honestly, to start in Houdini for the first time. So I really wanted to like take my time to learn the program and just like feel comfortable in it before I started diving in it. Um, so I wanted to build up a really solid reference base. Um, the feel of the groom was really important to me, just making sure I knew where I wanted to take it next. Um, and then running proxy tests and just familiarizing myself with Houdini. Uh, lots of tutorials, lots of help from my peers, my mentors. Um, and then development stage, I built out the groom in layers, and then I used lots of iterations. Uh, and it was a very long process of just trying things, failing, seeing what worked, and taking those aspects. And then final touches, just troubleshooting and polishing, um, simming the yarn on the dragon. And then at that stage, we had our final animation that we were going to use in the short, so just matching the grooms to that. Okay, so these are just some pictures from the preparation stage. Um, this was a call out sheet that someone on my team, Emily Hall made, um, and it's also her character concept. So this is like very helpful for me to have, um, just not having to like guess where I'm taking the groom, really knowing that I want like a matted fell, I want this texture to be smoother. Um, all that was very important to me. And then you can see there's lots of funky tests going on, just making sure that like, all of my pipelines were working and I had everything set up so that I could start developing once I was comfortable with that workflow. Uh, and then here's like the halfway point in the semester. You can see it was still looking crazy. Um, just one groom layer uh, and a lot of the developing didn't happen until towards the very end of the summer. Okay, and then as far as the development stage, um, 
I used a layered groom to help add depth and variation in the groom. Uh, I wasn't initially planning on doing that, but it ended up being that as I went, I wanted more and more depth, so I kept adding on grooms. And in the end, I ended up with my base groom, lift, clump, and straight hair groom. So I had all those on the same mesh layered. Um, and I used a lot of different grunge maps and pain maps to diversify which areas I wanted to be affected by the modifiers. Um, I tried to go in with like an open mind and try things that seemed maybe like a little bit unconventional uh, as far as workflow and just like tried to see what worked for me. Um, so lots of like interesting different tests I did. Um, I also, like I was saying, I relied a lot on randomization and masking uh, and I really wanted to have a lot of breakup in my silhouette. Um, and I kept the groom as procedural as possible for easy iterations and model switch outs. Um, the model is being worked on for a lot of this class uh, and same with animation. So it was really important to me that I was able to switch out uh, the groom and continually update it. And I really tried to keep it procedural until the end um, just to help my workflow a lot. And then as far as the tail animation, uh, I simulated all of the yarn right here along the dragon's back. Um, and for that process, I created a poly wire and um, from those curbs, or from the curbs that I brought from Maya, my NURBS curbs, I made a polywire from that, and I ran that through vellum. And then my result is what I used to then deform my final yarn shapes. Um, and I also, as far as animating the base groom, because the rest of the body wasn't simulated, it was just uh, deformed to the animation, I tried to break it up as much as possible just to reduce um, any kind of stretching and deformation that I didn't want. And here's a little breakdown of my different groom layers. And then here's how my simulation came out. So just giving it a little bit of movement. Okay, and then this was my end groom result. So yeah. It was really like daunting, like I said, at first to start it in Houdini, but I'm really glad that I made that jump uh, and I'm excited to use it in the future. So yeah, I'm gonna pass it off to my it. All right, well, I just have uh, the contact information for all the students, but uh, does anybody have any questions for them? Okay. Yes, that was one of, that was actually the, the prompt was a toy comes to life. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we had some, some dark themes, but. <laughs> Any other uh, questions for our, our wonderful, you guys come on up. I'm looking in the corner. I'm super impressed with the work, you guys. This is incredible. And I love the way you presented yourselves and the work, and I just loved it. So congrats to all of you. They worked extremely hard and were very happy when the summer was over. <laughs> Um, and Macy did not have to like get in it sucked into that. I, I was watching from afar. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I deal with games. I couldn't be in the stuff. Any other questions for our wonderful students? Oh, yes. Oh, here we go. I have a question for Ryan. Um, as far as the yarn HDA goes, I just want to know like the general workflow. Was that all done within one asset, or did you use the curve? Like I noticed you started with the uh, the big shapes, and then you went to the small shapes, small shapes. Is that all in one HDA, or was that spread out over a few different ones? So definitely, just how I work in Udini. Um, there's a lot of nesting and making smaller systems, just putting them in subnets and dragging them around. So at least for the specific yarn portion, uh, that base shape actually came from diving into the side effects website and pulling up um, some of that rope tutorial that they had shown earlier. So some of the, the base kind of thought behind 
that system and getting those shapes came from that tutorial. And then I kind of build out the rest of it from there. Does that okay. answer the question? Yeah, and I got like a quick follow up. So when you split up the yarn into, cause I'm, you had the twist and then the twist within the twist and then the twist within the twist. Did you work from bottom up or top down? Did you start with a big twist and then separate those twists into smaller ones or do you start off with a small twist? I, using twist is a horrible way to yeah, explain yeah. it. Uh, it. It's, Houdini definitely gives you a lot of power to um, run really complex uh, calculations, but the whole system really was based on just getting down to finer details. It's not really too complex. It's just running the same system uh, multiple times. Mm -hmm. So starting with a single curve, running that, turning it into three curves, and then just stepping down through each of those curves and running the same exact system. So it's really just recursively um, compounding on itself. But it starts with the main structure and then goes down to the fine threads. Does that make sense? Gotcha. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, of course. Are there any other questions? questions yeah, in the back. I feel like Phil Donahue. I think I just aged myself there, but. Um, for those of you who had their uh, first time using Houdini, uh, I'm curious to know like what your learning process was. What resources did you use? Did you do a lot of the learning like online or on the Houdini platform? Like, what was your process for that? Um, at least like for me, I use a ton of online tutorials. Um, there's a lot of... Step, step up to the, there you go. <laughs> um, yeah, I use a lot of online tutorials. There's like a lot of great resources for me online. Um, and I also had like a ton of help from my peers and the mentors at DreamWorks. Um, so definitely having like a support system was a big part of it for me. What would you, sorry, oh, I was just going to say, yeah, same for me, a lot of help from peers. And then Alex Timchenko at DreamWorks was a huge help when he came down to visit, um, just teaching me like basics and kind of helping me get that set up. So, yeah. So the mentorship definitely hel helped with that a lot, giving you guys the direction. So for somebody who's like starting out, what would your recommendation be? Feel, feel free to step up to the mic there. Yeah. Uh, start small, but also like don't be afraid to just dive in. It's okay to fail. Uh, <laughs> it's okay to fail a little bit. That's part of the process. Um, yeah, I think just honestly looking in places that you wouldn't like expect to look for help. Um, I ended up going through a lot of tutorials that like wouldn't necessarily be my first thought to go to, um, but ended up being really helpful. So. Are there other questions? I'll just, I'll back up on that. Uh, don't be afraid to fail thing. Like, yeah. I love Houdini to death, right? Yeah, we're here. But uh, we're not like uh, doing hard surgery. So feel free to break it and fail and don't, don't worry about taking that risk, you know? It's, it's, it's just Houdini, right? I'm sorry, who was the question? Right here. All right, um, I have a question about uh, micro dressing. So it's probably to Sarah. Um, were the meshes that were scattered around, were they generated in Houdini? Were the materials generated in Houdini? And um, I was also wondering how long that process took to be able to scatter them. Yeah, so the models actually came from one of our, from our lead modeler, um, Hannah, and she just gave me those models. And from that, from like Houdini, I could take those models and it would generate like thousands and scatter them across the road. So it was pretty, pretty nice and easy. <laughs> Yeah. How long did it take you, I guess? Um, not, I mean, maybe a few weeks. Yeah, just to like iterate and see like different results and what, happened, what it looked like. Yeah. Cool, yeah. thank you so much. Cool, anyone else, questions? Yeah, here we go. Uh, this is for Macy, I wanted to know, um, <laughs> in your procedural map, uh, door placement, how'd you handle that? And I guess um, the placement of just all the different assets along the uh, building. So the cool thing about wave function collapse is everything, each like piece of it is, it, you're, you're starting with like a grid form, um, but each piece of it has um, like is designated a tile number. So you know where your corners are, you know where your like 
I called them hallway pieces because they would have like one wall across from another. You know where um, like the pieces that aren't surrounding any things are. So you can actually, because they're all labeled and given a grid number or a tile number, um, which I believe I used uh, something known, I think it's the blob tile set. Um, it's the, the Houdini has um, the wave function collapse nodes and it's whatever the default one is, but um, that tile set, I can, you know, I can get my corners and then um, designate um, and blast away all the other pieces and say, oh, if there's a connection here between the walls of my building versus the um, floor, then I want two scatter points along there and then randomly sort through those and then just keep one. Um, just in a place, a good placement. Um, and that's just kind of how I handled it was a lot of, um, you know, with wave function collapse, you have all the information available to you um, in the terms of like tile set. Um, so you can make educated um, choices based upon those tiles. Okay. Yeah. Macy, how long did it take you to create that? So I worked on it over the course of a semester with Ben House, actually. Um, but um, <laughs> sorry, I didn't. But um, it was uh, it took it, it was because I had I was running around with like studio and a bunch of other classes. But um, I had a lot higher goals whenever I started. But the proxy geometry and um, basic system was what I was able to achieve over the course of the semester, um, and then. Yeah, uh, it, that system right there um, taught me a lot about um, attributes and how Houdini works with um, under the hood, what I can do, the power of, you know, manipulating something um, in one way, but then also being able to manipulate something else. Um, you, again, attributes are great because you have all the information there and you can... <laughs> Um, again, call you know your corners or call your hallways um, pieces in like the city that I did. Any other questions? Let's do another big round of applause for, for all this wonderful student work. Yeah. And the, the summer industry course students had ten weeks to do all that. We, we tacked two extra weeks before the semester started for pre-production, but yeah, they did those films in, in 10 weeks. Thank you, everybody. Very cool.